Welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm Carl, and here today we have a Cybertruck. Uh, today's actually the first day that I've been able to see the Cybertruck, looking around some of the different features. We're gonna talk about the interior features, but I can't not speak about the exterior as we get started. Of course, this is a stainless steel vehicle, stainless steel exterior body at least. Now that was done with the DeLorean, everyone is very familiar with that, but going all the way back to 1957-1958, Cadillac Eldorado Brom had a brushed stainless steel roof. So stainless steel has been done in automotive before, it hasn't fully caught on, and I'm certain some of the delays and some of the technical issues that Tesla had is one of the reasons why it probably hasn't caught on. This video is brought to you by Anchor and their new Maggo Wireless Charging Station. The Maggo Wireless Charging Station is the ultimate companion for your Apple ecosystem, allowing you to charge your iPhone, AirPods, and Apple Watch all at the same time. All of the modules are MagSafe compatible for a hassle-free wireless charging experience. And when you're not charging, they can be folded up for easy storage. The compact size of the Maggo Wireless Charging Station is true to our values of lean design, but it doesn't compromise on capability. Thanks to its 15 watt ultra fast charging, you get a lot of power in not a lot of time. Its size also makes it the perfect travel companion, so you can stay charged no matter where in the world you are. Best of all, the Mago wireless charging station is designed to keep your devices safe, equipped with advanced temperature control, over voltage protection, and many more unique safety features you don't have to worry about heat or damage while you charge. Use the link and discount code in the description to get your own MagGo wireless charging station from Anchor today. For me, looking at the exterior styling of this vehicle, it is not something that appeals to me. I don't like the look. I don't like looking at this and thinking of it as a truck, but does that matter? It doesn't really matter. Back when we did our video at the Interiors Expo, I said there's a difference between the what and the how. The what is the product that the OEMs send to the market that you have the opportunity to buy. But what you don't see is the how. And we're looking at the suppliers, the tooling, the manufacturing methods. Those methods, those different hows, can go many different ways. They don't support one single what. So when I look at these panels and look at the way this is assembled, when we tear this vehicle down, what we really need to focus on is the how. What did they do? What did they design that enabled them to do this vehicle? And can those methods, can those toolings, can those approaches be used to develop something else, something more innovative than what we've done traditionally? Looking at these panels, I was actually kind of surprised. I assumed that when they stamped this stainless steel that they would have turned edges. That's what we see in stampings today. But these are not. If you really get a close up view running down this edge, that is literally just the raw cut edge of the stainless steel. There's no return, there's no hem, which you would normally see in a panel. All right, well, what does that mean? Well, if I am blanking a piece of metal and I'm cutting, on the opposite edge, a burr will develop, and those burrs will be very, very sharp. In normal stamping for exterior bodies, since we do roll and hem those edges in uh, further processing, we hide those burrs. But this, you cannot hide anything in its blanking process. So, do they have to dress every edge of a panel that they are blanking out? I don't know, it would be interesting to see that process. But then we have the way the layers of these panels stack on top of each other. If you were to come here and look straight down the front of the vehicle, you'll notice this gap between these two different panels. I completely understand that a gap would have to exist. However, if I'm thinking of this aerodynamically and how air and material is approaching the front of this vehicle, I would assume that I would want to shingle this panel over top of this edge. And the same with this top here, I would want to shingle over top of this edge here. That's my assumption. There might be something in this structure that says, ah, oh, we really don't need to do that. But why I think that they don't do it that way is because of the side profile. 
looking at the side profile, that corner looks much cleaner without that overlap. And if I'm the owner of this vehicle and I'm approaching this vehicle, I'm always approaching to the side. So my angle of view, I cannot see those gaps from this angle. So I think that it's more the side styling that affected how they overlap those panels. When I look at this vehicle, I don't see a truck, I see more of an SUV. It's proportions, it's actually smaller than I thought it would be in real life. But even though I say that, I am somewhat impressed with the tailgate and the bed. The first opening up, the lighting is great. Everything that I would have to put in there, I can see that is wonderful. Opening up the tonneau. It's nice to have a tonneau that fully works. That's wonderful. Additional storage underneath the bed. If you have the space, why not use it? However, if I have lumber in this vehicle, this is not a space that I would be able to use. I've had discussions with other OEMs. If this is a truck and if I'm towing something, what do I need for towing? I need a tow hitch. I need chains. I need binders. I need my ratchet straps. Where am I storing those components? Most of the time you have to store it in the cab underneath the seats. Okay, but if I am towing, I do have that nice storage area here for my chains and my binders, but I only have access if I am not using the bed for anything else. So if I already had something in the bed taking up this space and now I stopped at a rental company and I need to get a small excavator, I cannot bind it down because my binders are buried underneath the other stuff that is loaded in my vehicle. Lots of times you'll see people driving with their trucks. They'll have the tailgate up, they'll have some eight foot lumber, which sticks up about two feet. And then you have to figure out how am I tying it down? How am I preventing things from blowing out? This is actually kind of neat because I can stop the tunnel where I want it. So I could have my lumber sitting here. I could still have tie downs, but then I can stop it right at the edge of my lumber. So I'm still protected, but yet I have something that is also providing security. So my lumber is not going to flip up, pop out. I kind of like being able to stop that where I want it to stop. Press a button that kicks out the door to present it to you. Let's, let's start with the seat, since I've already picked on the seat before in another video. It is slightly different from the Tesla seats that we've seen on our other vehicles that we've torn down. I would like to understand what is different about this headrest up here. The Tesla headrests I had a problem with in the fact that they were fixed headrest, but the way they were installed, they were still installed with all the same components of a moving headrest. They had chrome tubes that would go down into headrest guides that would lock in place, but it was basically a one-time use. Why am I paying money to chrome a tube that is completely hidden because you cannot adjust it and move it up? Why do I have headrest guides with the locks? if? Those headrest guides are one-time use. I cannot actually function them. So when this vehicle is torn down, it would be interesting to see if they've changed the way they're working the headrests for this new vehicle. Now, when we look at some of the spy videos or um, images that came out early, I was talking about the front side shield and the front of the seat. Now, you'll notice that this seat structure is sitting on a riser, that structure that is basically lifting up the track. We're moving along the track, that riser is fixed in place. The side shield, they still tried to keep a very, very crisp design. They tried to make it sharp angles similar to the vehicle. Now, there's a problem with those angles, however, when it comes to injection molding. And I don't know how much we're going to be able to get an image of it, but if you were to focus right on the front of this seat, there's actually a parting line that wraps that corner. Having an A-surface parting line is normally not allowed in production. Um, most OEMs won't want to have it, but because of the sharp angles of this design, we don't have a nice smooth rounded edge, which would be open and draft in the injection molding to allow that to not have an A-surface parting line. 
The materials are still very clean and very simple. We have layers, but the layers make sense going from top to bottom. So let's look at the door. We were talking about the light pipe in the new Model 3 recently. We have that same look here. We have a wrapped upper. We have a light pipe separating out our insert area. A wrapped armrest with controls. Now, this wrapped armrest passes all the way through. Most of the times when we are developing these things, we hate that just because that means that this surface must be continuous in some way all the way around. We have to have a closeout panel somewhere for the edge um, and managing those parts, especially parts that are not visible to the customer but only could possibly be felt, gets a little annoying. Going down, it is still a soft touch like material going all the way to the bottom. But when we look at the Model 3, we have that nice soft basically formed carpet map pocket. We don't have that. It is an injection molding with a rubber insert inside of the door panel. Now, the nice thing about that soft touch material on the Model 3 is that if you have things in there rattling around, you won't hear that. That's why on this one, they inserted that rubber um, insert to help dead in the noise, help dead in the sound. Now, when I opened up this vehicle and got in for the first time, I did get the feeling of getting in a truck because of the smell. I'm blaming that on the plastic and rubber mat, uh, floor mats. Um, I think that that was giving me the impression that I was getting. Let's look at this instrument panel. I'm going to talk about the different surfaces going towards the windscreen. The first one I'm going to talk about is this wrapped section here. Now, if I have a wrap section and if I want to avoid sewing, I have to make sure that I'm only wrapping material thickness. So you see that I have this sharp edge here. They avoid sewing on a side panel because they're only wrapping the material thickness. But still, you can see these wrinkles here. Whenever I am wrapping an outside corner, I always have too much material. Wrapping an inside corner, you don't have enough. So because of that, when the material is wrapped up around this corner, it bunches up, gets really thick, causing these wrinkles. Personally, for me, I don't mind seeing those features just because I know it's real. It's not some piece of plastic that was formed. Some people don't like it. Then we have this artificial suede material that is the first section. That is a cut and sew material. You can see the seam line here. That is a technical problem. We have this very long, straight sewn line. But again, this sewing is all done by hand by operators. And trying to keep something very straight over that length is very, very difficult. Now, one good thing is they're using black thread on top of a black material. It hides the imperfections, which I can see several waviness in the stitch from here. If they were to try and do a contrasting thread, something that was silver or white, you would see the inconsistency. It would just pop right out. So you kind of avoid a quality issue by making those colors match some type of a perceived quality issue. Now, it's hard to see from inside the vehicle, so and I don't know how we'll be able to see it underneath the lights, but going forward of that panel, we have this fabric wrapped um, forward piece. We would normally call this like the speaker cover area. This does look like it's a textile that has holes in it, so there may be speakers buried under there. It's an inexpensive material for the most part, but what are my problems with wrapping something this far forward in vehicle with a windscreen that is at this angle? This is taking very, very high sun loads. Now I have a black material underneath glass that is basically um, perpendicular parallel to the sun. I'm assuming that this is going to take a lot of heat. What is that going to do? That means the adhesive layer that is bonding that material is going to take a lot of heat and could possibly fail. Now I've saw that issue in Corvette where we had a very, very raked windshield. We had an air vent and what happened was the material that we wrapped it with underneath that heat would actually shrink and the material would pull away from the air vent and it actually walked up to 14 millimeters in measurements that I took. Came right out from underneath the air vent. So 
fabric normally does not shrink as much as other types of materials. So I'm hoping that this will not be an issue down the road. But this is an area that I would consider as a possible failure point. But looking at this glass, it does look like there is some sort of tinting in this glass. So hopefully they've been able to address that type of heat that they would experience on the glue layer underneath this fabric. So if I am an automotive tier one, what am I selling? I'm selling the actual components that are going into the vehicle. I'm selling the door panel, most likely as a completed door panel. I want to sell an IP that is ready to be loaded and bolted into the vehicle. Lots of times you'll have many different pieces and parts that are included in that assembly. Um, lots of times you cannot just directly put an IP into a vehicle. You're going to have closeout panels and attachment points. But look at this. These all appear to be solid panels from side to side. So here's a question. How do I unbolt that IP and take the whole thing out? Do I have caps covering bolts or screws in some location? Well, we'll find out and we'll see all of those locations as we tear this vehicle down. But I would almost be upset as a tier one, as a supplier, because there's very few components for me to try and make profit on. Um, it is very, very clean. It can be argued it's very, very boring. Um, but I don't have as many components. And the good thing about not having as many components is that's fewer components that you have to worry about quality issues on. But it's still somewhat stylish, depending on your style. Now, it's not a round steering wheel. It's not a complete yoke. So, of course, I still have an area to grab at the top. But, again, you should never drive with your hand at the top. This airbag is an explosive. You do not want that explosive banging up your arm. You want, when that explosive goes off, your elbow to be able to move around that bag that is expanding in front of you. You don't want to be on top and then throwing up your arm. It can't hinge that way. It's going to hurt. Now, I don't have an adjustable headrest, but for me, my body size may not be for everyone. You'll see this triangle protrusion in that headrest. It fits my neck and my head very, very well. Now, that triangle, depending on how tall you are, is going to move in relation to your body. Now, maybe this angle is a development that Tesla has done to try and mount to the adjustment of the height of the person that's in the vehicle. My sight line at the top. So I'm looking at this section of the header, then it's going into the sun visor. If I'm flipping that sun visor down, this is kind of a weird condition. The fact that I've now opened up a section of glass over top of the sun visor. All right. I do have an extension, which is nice on my view here, but I have opened up a section that can possibly blind me above the sun visor. Now this does have a tinted band across here. I have not been able to drive this vehicle or be out in the sun, so I don't know how it performs, but that is something that I would want to think about. Woo. Huh, don't know if I like that. The use of the sun visor seems kind of odd to me. So our center console. We looked at a wrapped center console on the Model 3 and it had stitching going from front to back. We don't have any stitching on here. Opening up the console, I have a storage bin. Now this seems kind of odd to me in the fact that this is a floating bin, but it's not self-storing. So it's not like it's a bin that I'm sliding forward and back to access what's underneath of it. I actually have to pull it out. Now there is a power port there, which is why I assume there is a gap here so that your cords can still stick out if they're being plugged in. Let's look at the floor. I did a very high-end vehicle a while ago, and they actually wanted a decorative floor. They actually wanted a cut-and-sew floor. 
Now, they were still trying to use the floor shape from their standard vehicle, which had all types of undulations and protrusions in it. That works for carpet because you're thermoforming the carpet. You can have many of those shapes. Trying to do a cut and sew, you can't. Um, I told them that your floor is going to look like Frankenstein because of all the seams that I'm going to have to put in these random areas. But this is relatively flat side to side. I'm certain that there's going to be some aftermarket people that are going to do some quilted, sewn, vegan, vinyl, leather type material that would fit to this floor because this floor is almost made for something like that. All right, so looking at this seat, there are some differences here. One thing that I want to make mention is what we saw on the Tesla Model 3, the new version of the Model 3. We were looking at the fold-down armrest, and we noticed that the headrest moved with the armrest. So, unlike the Model 3, however, this armrest is locked in position. There is a release cable right here to fold it down. However, it looks like I have to both release and pull down at the same time. Um, all right, that's not so bad. That gives us our cup holders. We still have a moving headrest. This also gives us access to the child tether, located here. But this is also a truck seat. What do truck seats normally do? Normally our cushion folds up and we have some sort of storage. We do have storage. You'll notice if hidden behind the seat belt on the corner, there's a little D ring that's a pull strap. So I would grab that ring, release my seat, and I can stand the seat up 90 degrees. This gives me a flat floor section if I'm loading in boxes and materials. That's nice. I don't really have an independent storage bin, but I have the bin in the tailgate. This is interesting. See this big piece of plastic? So this plastic is it's closing out the bottom of the seat cover. Here's the debate that I've had. When, what is less expensive if this was a piece of plastic or if this was a sewn carpet panel just on the seat cover? If it was a sewn carpet panel, that means that I would have to have some sort of a closeout. I would have zippers running along the side to close it out after I put the cover on. This cover is most likely attached independently all the way around this perimeter, and then this plastic panel is popped on. Depending on the cost of your carpet, the injection molding may be less expensive, but depending on the handling, the processing, the actual installation, maybe it's more. Um, I've done those calculations on several different vehicles, and depending on how you do it, it can either be a cost saver or a cost hit. So it's just interesting to me to see that they went ahead and put plastic panels on the bottom of the seats. We saw on the Tesla Model 3 that they put a screen that has controls for the rear occupant. So we see we have the same thing here. It does look like we have much of the same features. So we have our ventilation controls to the different occupants. Oh, look at that, even directional. That's quite nice. We have a seat control. Okay, so I have seat heat for the two occupants. And I have the ability to adjust the passenger seat for the rear passenger. Audio controls, <laughs> video controls, can't have that in the front. So this is actually kind of nice. I, I like this feature. I don't know how much money a feature like this is adding into the vehicle. There are some physical components that you're eliminating by putting something like this in, but putting in a screen, integrating those controls, there is a cost in all of that. It's up to the occupant or up to the owner whether or not the cost is worth it. Now, again, we saw this in the Tesla Model 3, a $35,000 vehicle. So I'm very impressed that they're able to integrate a feature like this into a vehicle that is at that price point, and we see we have it in the Cybertruck as well. So the good thing about this, this is not just a walk around and review video we are going to be tearing down this Cybertruck. We will be able to see those different features, how they were able to integrate them, how they made them work. I'm interested to see how these flat stamped body panels are actually attached to some sort of structure. Um, how does that structure integrate? 
does that structure enable us to do something new on other vehicles? What is supporting the decisions that they made for the Cybertruck? Those supporting decisions, I think, are the most important thing. We can see the how. How does this work? And we can use that how to go into other vehicles in the future. So please, if you're not subscribed, subscribe so that you can see the complete teardown of the Cybertruck and how they were able to accomplish what they did and how those hows can apply into the future. Thanks for watching Monroe Live. Have a good day.